service from Gorge del Rai Stenhouse Church. We're thinking about the theme, Jehovah Jireh, the God who provides. And may God bless us all through this time together. Hello. I'd like to begin our prayer with the words of Charles Simeon, an Anglican minister born in 1759. Let us pray. What is before us we know not, whether we shall live or die, but this we know, that all things are ordered and sure. Everything is ordered with unerring wisdom and unbounded love by thee, O God, who art love. Grant us in all things to see thy hand through Jesus Christ our Lord. God of grace. Although Charles Simeon didn't know the plans you had for him, he did know that your hand is to be found in all things. Sometimes, Lord, the world seems to be in a state of chaos, and without your discerning eye, we don't see the design and order you create around us. Father, there are times when we find it challenging to see your hand in all things. No matter how hard we try, we can't seem to comprehend the purpose of your actions, but still we have the trust and confidence to know that you will care for us and provide for us. In these days of uncertainty and anxiety, we know that you offer us hope beyond our wildest dreams. Lord, we offer you our doubts, our questions, our discomfort. Help us to accept your testing of us and to learn to walk with you in partnership. Although we may find it difficult, we know you are in control, that your power is mighty and your love is infinite. God of compassion, we think of Jesus in his anguish in the Garden of Gethsemane when he prayed, if it's possible, take this cup from me yet not my will, but your will be done. Father, we pray through your grace, our faith may be strong enough that we will be prepared to let your will be done, to make sacrifices and not to count the cost. Gracious God, 
just as you are a loving Father. Help us to be your obedient children, submitting ourselves to your will, secure in the knowledge that you cherish and provide for us. Please join me now as we bring all our prayers together in the words Jesus taught us. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now we'll hear from Bettina. Well, as you can see, I'm not in my usual location for this week's talk. And I wanted to, as I go for my walk today, to think about how we are provided for. This week may have been quite a big week for many of our family and certainly in our communities with the news of changes that might be happening, with the nearing the end of schools and nurseries for different children, different ages, wondering what's coming next, for the older teenagers wondering what is the next phase for them, whether that's more school or waiting for university places or jobs. Uncertainty comes with all of those times and for me the passage in Matthew about God providing for the birds and how much more for us has been in my mind for a while. So out here in nature I am reminded that God has everything ready for us. We need to see what he brings. I don't know if any of you have watched Spring Watch on the television recently, but as I sit here just now, I'm trying to listen and hear the different birds sounds and calls in between people going past and cars. Looking at the blackberries that are growing in the hedgerow here and seeing little birds over my shoulder in the tree remembering that Jesus talked about the birds in the air being provided for and how much more would we be provided for. As I look at this view, I can't help but remember that God really does provide the view, the sunshine, the quiet, the rustle of the breeze, the birds, that no matter how unpredictable or unknown the next stages might be. He still provides those things. In Spring Watch we watched baby birds in their nests waiting for the parent birds to come back and feed them and keep the nests clean and tidy. To feed the babies so that they can get to the edge of the nest and then some of them maybe tumble out in a rather undignified manner Others launch themselves out beautifully and gracefully. Nevertheless, those parents, those birds, have grown their offspring that they can be ready for their next phase. It's felt like that this week in many families. As little ones have graduated from nursery or being taken to have a look at their new school. Older children, the same thing going to have a look at where they are going to be for the next phase of their education. Those baby birds getting ready to fledge from their nests, not that different from us packing backpacks for children going to school and nursery, not very different from parents encouraging and helping their teenagers and young adults to discern what to do next encouraging, maybe nagging, but trusting that the next thing is going to come. So for us, we can trust that God provides. And in the end, he provides more than he does for the birds.
Genesis chapter 22, verses 1 to 14. Sometime later, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Then God said, take your son, your only son whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on the mountain I will show you. Early the next morning, Abraham got up and loaded his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. He said to his servants, Stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship and then we will come back to you. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac, and he himself carried the fire and the knife. As the two of them went on together, Isaac spoke up and said to his father Abraham, Father, yes, my son, Abraham replied. The fire and the wood are here, Isaac said, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. When they reached the place God had told him about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then he reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham. Here I am, he replied. Do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son your only son. Abraham looked up and there was a thicket. There in the thicket he saw a ram caught by its horns. He went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called that place, the Lord will provide. And to this day it is said, on the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. Matthew six twenty five to thirty four. Do not worry. Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food, and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow. They do not labour or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendour was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own.
looking at the names of God in the Bible. And today we're looking at the name Jehovah Jireh, which means the God who provides. It's easy to affirm that statement when you're sitting with a full stomach, decent financial security for the future, and a measure of good health and strength for you and your loved ones. It's quite another thing to cling on to this conviction when everything in your circumstances shouts the opposite. That's the tester, isn't it? The prophet Habakkuk proclaimed, though the fig tree does not bud, and there are no grapes on the vines, though the olive crop fails and the fields produce no food, though there are no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God my Saviour. That's when faith in Jehovah Jireh, the God who provides, is shown to be a genuine bedrock declaration of trust in the hardest times of life, or a mere ideal fantasy for the good times only. Jehovah Jireh, God provides. As we continue to look at the names of God, we find that they are seldom attributed to God as proper names, like the one which you and I bear today. Rather, they are ascribed to God in the context of a series of happenings where that aspect of God's character is revealed and made known. So we've heard God named as El Roi, the God who sees, as he saw the plight of Hagar, Sarai and the people and acted with compassion toward them all. Last week we heard God declared as El Shaddai, God Almighty, the God for whom nothing is impossible. Abraham was 99 years, Sarah was 90 years of age. They were without a child, yet the Lord affirmed that they would have a child from whom would come the people of God. It seemed that there was not a chance that that would come to pass. The physical obstacles to this becoming a reality were so vast. But God showed himself to be the God of the impossible. El Shaddai, God Almighty. In the early 60s, a Bible scholar wrote a book which influenced a generation thinking about the person of God. The title of the book was Your God is Too Small. The problems in our world seem all powerful, but God is almighty. The pandemic is mighty, but God is almighty. However, as I say, it's relatively easy to echo these statements in a comfortable deck chair, but quite another to do so when everything you depend upon is called into question. Fast forward some 15 plus years or so. Isaac, the longed for and much loved child of Abraham and Sarah, has been wonderfully given to them by the Lord. At last, the heir had come, through whom all the hopes and promises, not only of Abraham and Sarah, but of the people of God, could be fulfilled. Can you begin to imagine then the shock waves which rippled out from the opening verses we read from Genesis 22? Sometime later, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Then God said, take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains I will tell you about. So many questions run through my mind as I read this. Why did God test Abraham? Why did God ask him to offer the son for whom they had waited so long? What kind of God could make such demands on people? 
These are huge questions which hopefully will be answered as we follow the story through. But what I want you to notice is the astonishing fact that Abraham does not seem to voice any objections to these commands from God. There are no attempts to argue or put off. Instead, we read, early the next morning, Abraham got up and saddled his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. The fact that later in the story, we are told that Isaac carried the wood for the burnt offering on his back up the mountain suggests he was not a small boy, but a strong young man at this point. He was old enough to make up his own mind whether to go along with this scenario or whether to stay well clear of it. And he willingly went. The fire and wood are here, Isaac said, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. The Lord will provide was at the heart of Abraham's faith. I wonder if you realise how unique that concept is, which is at the core of faith in the Lord compared with other world religions. Buddhism, for example, does not believe in a personal God. Technically, they do not worship any God. As a result, there is no one out there to provide anything to worshippers. By contrast, Hinduism pr proclaims that there are over 300 million gods, but these gods are not capable of developing a loving and personal relationship with those who worship. Then there's the Muslim faith. They have only one God, Allah, but he doesn't really offer a caring connection with those who worship. He sits in judgment. He is the one to be submitted to and obeyed. Our God, the God of the Bible, is unique. He is Jehovah Jireh. Our God is the God who provides. I pose the question, what kind of God could make such demands as he did upon Abraham? The answer is, the God who made the same sacrifice for our sakes as he was asking Abraham to make for him. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. The striking difference between Abraham's offering of his son and the offering of God of his son is that whereas God stopped Abraham from striking the fatal blow upon Isaac, the Lord allowed the full force of his judgment against sin to fall upon his beloved son Jesus, so that as he carried the sins of the world, we could be forgiven by faith in him who voluntarily paid the price for our sins. Abraham and Isaac's faith in God was extraordinary. The writer of Hebrews in chapter 11 verse 17 writes, By faith Abraham, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. He who had received the promises was about to sacrifice his one and only son, even though God had said to him, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. Abraham reasoned that God could raise the dead. And figuratively speaking, he did receive Isaac back from death. For Abraham and Isaac, God provided a ram caught by its horns. He went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering 
instead of his son. So Abraham called that place, the Lord will provide. That's why he told the servants to wait for them at the foot of the mountain, while I and the boy will go over there and worship. We will worship and then we will come back to you. Abraham thoroughly believed and expected to come back down the mountain with his son, having worshipped God. Even if God had to raise his son from the dead, from the ashes, to keep his promise through Isaac. That's great faith Abraham and Isaac showed. But even greater is the love that God demonstrated for sinners like us in giving Jesus his one and only beloved son to save us from sin and judgment. Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, exclaimed John about Jesus. But before we close, let me return to one question I've not addressed in these words. God tested Abraham. Why? It's interesting that Genesis 22, where this story is recorded, is the first time that Abraham spoke of God being his provider. Now, God had always provided for Abraham, and I'm sure at the back of his mind, Abraham had always believed this to be true. But perhaps, like us, Abraham's active trust in God as his provider was not as strong as it might be. An interesting insight is found in James 2, verse 21 to 23, about this topic. James writes, Was not our ancestor Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith and his actions were working together, and his faith was made complete by what he did. In other words, Abraham's readiness to offer up his only son was the point at which his faith in God was put into practice totally. It was when his faith was completed and God could rely upon Abraham to be the leader he had always purposed him to become. That's why in Genesis 22.1 we read God tested Abraham. When God tests us, it's not to hurt us or to harm us, but it's to provide the help we need to come through such tests and become more effective for him as a result. Paul writes, and God is faithful. He will not let you be tested beyond what you can bear. But when you are tested, he will also provide a way out so that you can stand up under it. Jehovah Jireh, God provides. As the story of Abraham illustrates powerfully, this does not mean that we can assume an easy, carefree journey through life as a result. But we can be certain that he will prove to us, my grace is sufficient for you. There are times when God will put all of us in the midst of a struggle or storm. And it will be at those times that our faith will be tested and challenged. And at those times, our faith may be strengthened. The irony of faith is that the very moments when our faith is revealed at its strongest are those moments when our faith may feel to us at its weakest. I'm certain Abraham was feeling weak in sight, as weak as a kitten, but he still remained trusting in the Lord completely. And so we end with the beautiful words of Jesus about Jehovah Jireh, the God who provides. Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life. 
Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Trust him in the darkest moments. Trust him when your faith is small. Trust him when to simply trust him is the hardest thing of all. May you prove that God is Jehovah Jireh, the God who provides for your life. Amen. And now let's come to God in prayer. Dear Father God, we thank you for the message that you have given to us through your servant, Peter. We praise you for you are Jehovah Jireh, the God who provides. You hold everything in your hands, and we are grateful for the fact that there is no need too big for you to meet, and no situation too complex or too out of control for you to address. Lord God, nothing takes you by surprise. We thank you that you know our needs before we even ask, and you care for each one of us so much more than you care for the birds of the air and the flowers of the field. You are aware of all that concerns us. We bring to you those who are sick at this time, and who are struggling in this moment, indeed in this very season. We are mindful that the challenges and difficulties we all face can affect us in different ways. We look to you, though, as the only one who holds the provision for our lives and the solution to our problems. We ask for your answer in your timing, in your plan. We ask for this to be given for every need that weighs down on our hearts. Forgive us, Lord, for doubting you, for worrying, and for trying so hard to work everything out on our own and in our own strength. Help us to trust in you, Lord, more each day. Help us in our unbelief. We choose to recognize and to believe that you are the one who is able to accomplish far more, to do far greater than we can ever think is possible. Thank you for the abundance of blessing and goodness that you have already shown to us, because your greatest provision was a supply of a lamb, a lamb without spot, a lamb without blemish. You supplied the atoning sacrifice for our sin, and by doing so you showed us, in the person and work of your Son, Jesus, the greatest example of your loving concern for your creation. We do not want our faith to be distracted away from your goodness, though, Lord, we do admit that it is hard not to be affected by all the worries and problems that are all around us. We sometimes lose heart when we see the injustice, when we see the hatred and the fear that is spread all around us, and we feel even more helpless when our own lives are personally impacted. Help us, Lord, to trust in you this day and every day, for we are so grateful for your power and your joy that fills our lives. Thank you for teaching us to be content in all circumstances, and we lean on you for the strength that is sure to come as we put our trust in the living God who provides. And Father, help us to look upon the difficulties we see as opportunities for you to move for you to show yourself to people who need you most of all. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the Church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen.
Jesus. Yeah.